Hello, everyone. As the fellows may recall from my prior talks, I like to focus on tiny anatomic structures on the MR images which have important clinical functions. Today, I'm starting with another small structure. Can anybody identify the abnormality on this image? I tried to make it small like on, in the, it would be in the reading room. Anybody see anything abnormal? I see no responses on the chat box. Very good. Daniel sees a abnormal signal on the right of the aqueduct. Very good. A little easier now in the large image. Even easier on the T2. And obvious on the diffusion. This patient had a palsy of the third nerve due to a stroke. This is just an introductory case. Today I'm going to be talking about the third cranial nerve, the oculomotor nerve. The oculomotor nerve supplies five muscles the levator palpebrae, the superior rectus, inferior rectus, inferior oblique, and medial rectus. Uh, oculomotor nerve palsy results in ptosis, weakness of the medial, superior, and inferior recti. The globe cannot be elevated or adducted. There's divergent squint, eyes deviate outward, there's also loss of accommodation and convergence and loss of light reflex and pupil dilatation. This uh, picture here kind of highlights the main finding, the lid droop, the elevated brow to make up for that, and the downward adducted gaze, abducted gaze. Now, let's start with the nucleus of the third nerve. We have to identif identify the periaqueductal gray material, which we can see here on the T2 image, slightly bright. The acromotor nucleus sits just at the anterior edge of the periaqueductal gray. Another important nucleus right adjacent to it is what's called the Edinger Westfall nucleus, which controls the the ciliary and pupillary sphincter muscles. We can see here the course of the parasympathetic fibers. The afferent uh, fibers travel with the optic uh, nerve and the optic radiations. The efferent fibers start at the Edinger Westfall nucleus, continue with the third nerve, and in the orbit they diverge into the ciliary ganglion where the postganglionic efferent fibers uh, travel then. So again, back to this case I showed in the introduction, a patient who came with a third nerve palsy secondary to a stroke, and we could see the abnormal signal and the abnormal diffusion in their periaqueductal gray. Here's another stroke, patient with lupus, diplopia, and a question of a third nerve lesion, and we see a small stroke and the periaqueductal gray on the left side, we can see on all the various images. Now here we have another stroke, which is more anterior uh, to where the nucleus is, and the question is, is also involving the third new uh, fibers, and that relates to the travel of the fibers from the nucleus. As you can see, they travel anteriorly through the region of the red nucleus 
and then come out in the interpeduncal cistern. This patient had a shower of emboli, and you can see that this stroke is in the region of the course of the third nerve fibers. Here's a much larger stroke, again in a patient with a third nerve palsy, and we can see again that this is involving the area of the nucleus as well as the course of the fibers anteriorly towards the intrapeduncal fossa. Again, a patient who showered emboli. Okay, what is the disease process here? Again, this time not a stroke. Anybody? Correct, as Nate says, multiple sclerosis. We see the abnormal signal and slight enhancement on the post-contrast images. Not as well seen uh, on the MP rage as on the spin echo. And here's another case of MS showing uh, the lesions in the region of the nucleus as well along the course of the fibers towards the interpeduncular fossa. Another cause here? Anybody? Correct. As Eric said, this was lung metastases. See the round target lesion in the rear area of the nucleus. Patient again presented with third nerve palsy, and we see other metastatic lesions. Now this was a very interesting case that the neurologist got very excited about. Patient presented with the right third nerve symptoms and a contralateral cerebellar ataxia. And here he had a small stroke. The, the axial did not cut through exactly, but we can see it on the coronal. And here's the abnormality near the interpeduncal fossa seen on the axial coronal plane a little bit of enhancement on the post gado images. And here it is on the sagittal. This is a, a known neurologic syndrome called Claude syndrome. Claude syndrome consists of ipsilateral third nerve symptoms and contralateral cerebellar ataxia. It's secondary to involvement of the third nerve and the cerebellar efferent fibers to the thalamus in the region of the red nucleus slash the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles. So again, you recall that this is not a stroke as I, when I talked about the brainstem structures. This is just the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles. And here it is again, as I showed before, on the axial and coronal plane, here are the crossing fibers of the superior cerebellar peduncle. Uh, it's in red on the DTI because of the right to left and left to right direction of the fibers. Now, again, on this coronal anatomic specimen, this is the superior cerebellar peduncle, this is the tachycation, and the fibers continue to the red nucleus, as we can see here, crossing over to the red nucleus. So again, if you have a stroke in this location, you'll end up with a Claude syndrome, just as we can see here. So that in would involve the, the region of the red nucleus, uh, as well as where the fibers of the third are traveling. So again, ipsilateral third nerve symptoms and contralateral cerebellar ataxia, because the stroke is right in this location, involving the red nucleus and the fibers traveling of the third nerve. Now, to see the entire course of the cisternal portion of the third nerve uh, is not that common. The reason is that a slanted course of the fibers as they slant inferiorly as they travel anteriorly. But here we can see on these images the entire course from the interpeduncular fossa towards the back of the Meckel's cave, the cavernous sinus, 
again, three different examples of the entire course of the cisternal portion of the third nerve. But most of the time, on clinical scanning, you only see portion of the third, and important to be able to identify it. Here's a little bit as it comes out of the interpeduncular fossa. Here a little more. Here we see a segment of the cisternal portion. A little more over here, over here. And here we see a little more because of the angle. So we have to be able to identify segments of the third nerve. Not only can we see it on T2s, but we can also see it on DTI, as we can see here, just the, the segment of the, of the third nerve. I now, the third nerve may be absent, as was described in the talk that was given at the last ASNR meeting this year. No third nerves. It's a child with an unusual anomaly where it's absent from birth. Now, instead of going through the differential uh, on abnormal enhancing of the third nerves, if the fellows could just write down a list of the various things that we discussed with the fifth nerve, because basically the same diseases involve the various cranial nerves. Here we see abnormal enhancement of both third nerves. Please write down what the possibilities are, and we'll see if you cover all the various diseases. Okay, I think that Eric and Gino uh, have covered lymphoma, Lyme, MS, uh, leukemia. Uh, let's see what else was mentioned here. Uh, I think sarcoid, Eric mentioned lymphoma, Lyme, Mad, Gino mentioned leukemia, again sarcoid. I think all the diseases are more or less that we talked about are, are covered. So this was lymphoma. Again, involvement of the cisternal portion of the nerve. This was a case of ac acute myelogenous leukemia. Looks similar. We only see portions of the nerve enhanced. This was a breast metastatic disease involving the third nerves bilaterally. This was a metastatic lymphoma involving where the nerves come out of the interpeduncular fossa. You see the large abnormal signal here would be right in this location. This patient had a right Bell's palsy followed by left six nerve symptoms. And again, this was a case of Lyme disease, as we mentioned. Now, Lyme is very important to mention any time you think of MS. This looks like a classic MS case, uh, this case from the literature. And the author makes a very important point that Lyme should be included in the imaging differential diagnosis of facial neuritis, multiple enhancing cranial nerve, enhancing radiculitis, leptomeningeal disease, and any symmetric orbital myositis with cranial neuritis. So, and I, as you know, I always insist, you mention MS, you mention Lyme disease in the differential, because this looks like exactly like a classic uh, MS when it was uh, Lyme disease. And this was the case again that you mentioned, involvement of the interpeduncular fossa here a little bit of uh, enlarged infundibulum. This was neurosarcoidosis. Another case of neurosarcoid, you can see all the enhancing nodules. So again, a disease that was mentioned in the differential. And of course, I like to always saw hemosiderosis, which in this case involved all the cranial nerves. Here we see the third nerve involved by hemosiderosis secondary to extensive bleeding and 
in the uh, surgery of a GBM. This is a page, just Bell's palsy. You don't expect the other nerves to be involved, but in this case, there was really no enhancement of the seventh nerve, but there was enhancement of the third nerve. Unusual case. Any disease that very unusual in this country, which we did not mention in the differential, which involved the third nerves? Anybody? Correct. Dan mentioned TB, hit the nail on the head. This was tuberculous meningitis involving the third nerve. This was an unusual case of tomologic migraine, again enhancing the cisternal portion of the third. Okay, what is the abnormality here? Any abnormal structures? What side is abnormal? Right, as Eric says. There's an extra little tissue here. What is this? This is a breast metastatic lesion at the area where the third nerve comes out. The patient again had third nerve symptoms, so this is where the tumor was sitting, right where the right nerve was uh, exiting from the interpeduncular region. And here it is on the sagittal image. Remember that we can identify the third nerve and the sagittal plane. Here, interpeduncular fossa, here's a nerve coursing anteriorly towards the cavernous sinus, and this lesion sits right in this region here within the interpeduncular fossa. Another case of a lesion in the region of the, uh, where the third nerve on the right would be traveling. We faintly see the left one so a tumor mass in the same location as the prior case, and this was a lymphoma, again, occupying uh, this region involving the right third nerve as it exits, again, in this location over here. Okay, what is the abnormality here? Correct. Eric came through. This is an epidermoid. There's, there's some tissue here in the prepontine cistern. Again, on the heavily T2, we see irregular tissue in the cistern. Notice the third nerve is kind of bowed and cased in this lesion. And the clincher, of course, is the diffusion image, which is classic for epidermoid. So this was an epidermoid in the prepontine cistern uh, trapping the left third nerve. Notice here's the normal right. This is kind of bowed because it's encased. And that's the difficulty with these lesions because the nerves are caught within the tumor. Now let's just review the normal anatomy of the course of the cisternal portion of the third uh, as, it, as it travels from the interpeduncular fossa towards the cavernous sinus. So we st if we start at the level of the, in so this is the interpeduncular fossa. We see these two little bumps here. These are the third nerves coming off uh, in the interpeduncular fossa. Then as we travel anteriorly, we can see the nerve traveling a little more medially. Here it's classically between the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery. Then it goes 
towards the cavernous sign, I'll go a little more detail. This is an important location of the nerve. So we can identify on the coronal T2 the nerve as it travels in, in its various medial direction. So this is why this is important. Here we see marked enhancement of the third nerve by lymphoma. But notice that we can identify the involvement of the third nerve on either side here within the interpeduncal fossa. Here we see the normal. This is markedly expanded. Just remember, sometimes you may not get a good axial cut, so you should be able to identify also on the on the coronal plane. Of course, the fifth nerve is also involved, the seventh. So there's diffuse uh, lymphomatous involvement. Now, here we see both third nerves kind of sitting above the pons here on the coronal plane. And notice again, here's the pons. We see both third nerves as well as this, the IACs are also enhancing. So these lymphoma involving the third nerves in the coronal plane. And this is like the classic where normally you should see the third nerve on the coronal T2, again, between the posterior cerebral and the superior cerebellar artery. So here's the third nerve, and here we see it in lymphoma, markedly enlarged, enhancing between the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebellum. Now again, as I said, we can identify on the sagittal plane the third nerve. And notice here, we see the third nerve traveling between the posterior cerebral artery above it and the superior cerebellum below. The same here, posterior cerebral, superior cerebellar, and here's the third nerve. Again, the third nerve on these thin T2s, posterior cerebral, I mean, superior cerebellar and posterior cerebellar artery, and pos posterior cerebral artery, cerebral artery. So again, more lesion, acute lymphocytic leukemia involving the third nerves between, well, here we only see actually the superior posterior cerebral artery. This is a normal again. Sometimes you only see the posterior cerebral artery, not the superior cerebellar. This was mental cell lymphoma. Here it is on the axial plane. Here it is on the coronal plane. Patient was Lyme. Again, abnormal enhancement of the third nerve just below the posterior cerebral arteries. We don't see the superior cerebellar. Again, no more for comparison. Now, a little further anteriorly, there are really few landmarks. So here, again, the two third nerves enhancing by the mantle cell lymphoma. Here, Lyme disease on the coronal plane, cisternal portion of the third nerves enhancing. This was ophthalmologic migraine, the third nerve, the TB faintly enhancing in the coronal plane. Now this is an important location to identify the third nerve. The th all the posterior fossa cranial nerve have like little extension of the CSF, and we already know of the large Meckel's cave, but turns out that the third nerve also has a little CSF surrounding it as it goes anteriorly towards the cavernous sinus. And the other nerves also have little pockets, but let's just focus on the thir third nerve. So here's a coronal anatomic specimen. This this is the dorsum cella here. These are the two posterior clinoids. A coronal anatomic specimen, exactly this location, shows the dorsum cella with a posterior clinoid. <clears throat> Notice the two thirds nerve sitting on either side of the posterior clinoids. 
And here we can see beautifully on this T2, here are the posterior clinoids, here's the third nerves surrounding by little CSF uh, on, on either side, even seen better here. Again, the dorsum, posterior clinoids, and here the th normal third nerve surrounded by a little bit of CSF as they travel towards the cavernous sinus. And the same thing when you have abnormality of the third nerve, here's a case of lymphoma showing the enhancement of the third nerve exactly in this location. Okay, we have a patient presenting with acute third nerve palsy. What do we have to worry about? Correct. Nate, Gino, Eric all mentioned aneurysm. So anytime you have an acute third, you'll get the whole slew of requests. CTA, MR, the whole body MR, including the lumbar spine, the usual. And here's a classic case showing why you have a third nerve lesion in, when you have an aneurysm. Here's a large pecum aneurysm. And notice again, if we look at the anatomy here, posterior clinoids, the third nerve. And here we can see, here's the aneurysm just laterally to the posterior clinoid. And we know that the third nerve would be sitting right over there. This little gap is between the, the bone and the aneurysm is just lateral to it. So you could see why you'll end up with third nerve symptoms as the nerve uh, gets compressed by the enlarging aneurysm, pushing it against the dorsum cell and the clinoids. So this is kind of a nice example of why you end up with a third nerve palsy. Okay, a different case. Which side is the abnormality on? Gino says the right, and he is correct. Notice the third nerve on the left, by itself, surrounded by CSF. Here's the posterior cerebral artery, superior cerebellar. Notice that on this side, the third nerve is a right in adjacent to the posterior cerebral artery. And this patient presented with right in a sequoia, and the right nerve is in contact with the posterior cerebral artery. And a sequoia is unequal pu pupils. This pupil was abnormal because of I guess a vascular conflict between the nerve and the posterior cerebral artery. So you could see the, the proximity compared to the opposite side. Again, for comparison, what normal should be like and the abnormality on this side. This was another patient presented with diplopia and had a small aneurysm at the tip of the basilar artery on the MRA here. And here we can see, here's the aneurysm pointing towards the interpeduncular fossa. So here's the third nerve on the right, here's the third nerve on the left, and here's the aneurysm. And we postulated that, be, that we, only, we may not see the wall of the aneurysm here, but it's kind of closer to the third nerve, so possibly there was some involvement of the left third because of the proximity to the aneurysm <coughs> um, and may explain the patient's diplopia. And this is like the classic case. Unfortunately, I misplaced this case and I do not have any history. I would love to have known if the patient had a third nerve palsy. But this is like the classic 
uh, image that you would expect with a third nerve palsy. So here's posterior cerebral, superior cerebellar, here's the aneurysm. Here on this normal specimen, posterior cerebral, superior cerebellar, basilar artery, here's the third nerve coming out between the two. And if we look at this image here of a normal, the aneurysm would be sitting right over here. So you expect uh, to see third nerve uh, abnormalities in this case, but unfortunately I have no history uh, to demonstrate that this was the case. Now interestingly enough, I was looking in montage uh, searching for aneurysms and third nerve lesion. Turned out the the very few cases, a lot of patients come in with third nerve symptoms, but no aneurysms are found. Here's an interesting case where uh, there was a, this is from last year, this was a follow-up study after coiling where the aneurysm got larger. So here we see the aneurysm here arising at, at the origin of the superior cerebellar artery, a uh, very large aneurysm. If you look, here it is massive on the axial uh, T2 images, and you, the third nerve on the left is very compressed here. Here's the right, looks normal. The left we just see, and then the aneurysm is just sitting over here. Same thing, nice right third nerve. We don't, can identify it compressed by this large aneurysm. But the patient had no third nerve symptoms, at least examined both by neurologist and neurosurgeon in the epic notes, there was no mention of any third nerve symptoms. So uh, just like with trigeminal neurology, many times you see s severe conflict between the vessel and the nerve, but the patients have no symptom. This patient had no symptoms of third nerve palsies. Here's another case with no third nerve abnormalities. What is the abnormality here? Which side is the abnormality? Correct. As Gino and Rich said, left side. We see a structure here. What is it? So we have to investigate it. Turn out that this patient, who was fairly young, had a very tortured and dolichoarctatic uh, P1 segment of the left posterior cerebral artery. There were no aneurysms. This was all a tortured vessel. But you could see the size of this ectatic posterior cerebral artery, and it's really compressing the third nerve uh, Again, notice the full extent of this lesion, and we see the third nerve must be compressed here. And here's the right, the normal right. We cannot identify the left except maybe a little piece here. Patient had no third nerve palsy. This was an unusual case that actually did have a third dilated left pupil. But there were no arterial abnormalities. There was some sort of a venous abnormality here with a large number of abnormal veins. Here on the coronal CTA, we see the basilar artery, posterior cerebral, superior cerebellar. And then there's this large vein and another, see another branch here. Again, um, um, anomalous veins. Here they are on the sagittal plane traveling and along the clivus, and here there should not be an artery coming like this. So this anomalous vein entered the interpeduncular fossa, both on the axial uh, image, and we can see it here also in the sagittal, entering the interpeduncular fossa. So this was really the only explanation for the third nerve symptoms because of this abnormal vein doing something in the region of the exit of the third nerve. 
Okay, what is pupillary sparing? Anybody? Anybody remember from medical school? Very good, Daniel. Third nerve palsy without pupil involvement. Preservation of the pupillary reflex. And why is that? The parasympathetic fibers run on the outer edge of the third nerve. So if you have, let's say, an aneurysm or a lesion compressing the nerve, you will get involvement of the, of the pupillary reflex. But if you have an internal lesion involving the nerve, you will, you will be sparing uh, the, the pupil. And that's, and that's what pupillary sparing is, uh, refers to. And there's a, a number of lesions that will come with pupillary sparing. Diabetic, hypertension, microvascular disease, you may have it in a post-viral syndrome, meningitis, MS, or let's say some intrinsic neoplastic lesion involving the nerve. Uh, so these are the various causes where you would have pupillary sparing. And here's a case. Patient had a transient third nerve palsy with pupillary spares, sparing. There was a question of possible diabetic etiology. And again, we see here the abnormality and the course of where the fibers would be traveling from the nucleus. Okay, what do we have here? This patient had this lesion unchanged for five years, had a left third nerve symptoms. Unfortunately, we do not know what this was, but the possibility is, as uh, Gino mentions, was either a schwannoma or what else would you consider here? Anybody? Correct, as Daniel mentioned, meningioma. So these are the two, and as I said, the lesion was unchanged for at least five years. And here it is on the coron here it is on the axial post gatto. Here it is coronally. Here's a nice coronal T2, again showing the position between the posterior cerebral and the superior cerebellar artery, the normal for comparison. So uh, it's either of these two possibilities. What, what's the abnormality in this case? Again, again, as Eric mentions, everybody mentioned the correctly, there was a large lesion on the right side. This patient presented with a third nerve symptoms on the right side. I presume everybody wants to see more images. What's the diagnosis now? Dermoid was mentioned. Anything else? Infected cyst or an aneurysm? That's pretty good, getting close. Gino mentioned an infected cyst. Anyway, at the time, after the MR, we were considering, could this possibly be an aneurysm? Anybody, uh, aneurysm is at least worthwhile consideration. Patient had a 
nothing on the MRA. Did not see it. I mean, we saw it, but no, didn't seem like it was connected. Patient then underwent an angio. No, no aneurysm. And post-surgery, the sur the post-surgical diagnosis was this. This was a cystic schwannoma of the third nerve. But turned out that after pathologic examination, it turned out not to be a schwannoma, but was is being carried now as an arachnoid cyst. Uh, what happened to the third nerve? It's hard, we cannot even identify it. Here's the superior posterior cerebral, superior cerebellar. Here's the lesion. We do not see the third nerve. But the final pathology on this was an arachnoid cyst uh, in the cistern compressing the temporal lobe and also in involving the third nerve. And these are the last images that I'm showing. Why am I showing these? As Gino correctly says, there's atrophy of the extraoxular muscles. Due to what? Correct, as Gino says, denervation atrophy. A nice example, notice the abnormal signal and the reduced size. This was a presumed viral denervation atrophy of the muscle innervated by the ocular motor nerve. See again the abnormal signal and the small size of the nerves. Interestingly, the medial rectus uh, is spared here. Okay, this is the last case I'm showing, and next week I'll be talking about the fourth nerve and the medial longitudinal, longitudinal fasciculus. Thank you for your attention.